My name is Mwelila Tele. I'm an oral history researcher for Uluazi program. I'm a senior librarian at the University of KwaZulu Natal Campbell Collections. Today is the 10th of April 2010. We're at DUT, Deben University of Technology, Emerald Sultan Campus. I'm interviewing Ila Gandhi, or Ma Ila Gandhi, the granddaughter of Mahatma Gandhi, and the Chancellor of the Deben University of Technology. The, de uh, the Deputy Vice Chairperson of the International Center of Nonviolence ICON. Okay, Mahatma Gandhi came to South Africa in uh, 1893, and um, he, you know, when he came here, he came here on business as a lawyer. He was a qualified lawyer, and uh, his values and his uh, outlook to life was completely different from that um, which uh, he, you know, learned to um, absorb much later in life um, at the time when he was leaving South Africa. Uh, when he came, he was dressed in a suit and tie and he was very conscious of both his status as a lawyer uh, of his dressing, he was, you know, had to have properly starched collars and things like that. And um, those were the values according to which he lived at that time in 1893. But um, soon after that, after coming to South Africa, he realized that there was uh, racism in South Africa. He was treated badly because he was not a white person. He was asked to remove his turban at the court house in Durban, where the, uh, where the History Museum is located at the moment. That was the old courthouse. And um, he had to leave the court because he refused to remove his turban. Uh, he was thrown out of the train in Peter Maritzburg. And this was all just a few days after he arrived in South Africa. So those experiences had a tremendous effect on him as a person. Um, and then later on, uh, he saw um, how other Indian people were treated. Uh, one of the things that he had to decide at the Peter Maritzburg station was whether he should just leave South Africa and go away back to India, where he was living a comfortable life, or whether he should stay and accept the situation in the country and uh, adjust to it, or whether he should stay and fight that situation. And that was the crucial decision that he took on that night, that he should stay and fight the situation. So that really changed his life uh, because now he began to think about how, how can he change this terrible system in South Africa. And, and when did they actually move to, to the Phoenix Settlement? The Phoenix Settlement. Yes. The Phoenix Settlement was established in 1904. And um, it was established because, uh, you know, Gandhi had read this little book by Tolstoy called Unto This Last. And Tolstoy's philosophy was that, um, you know, he believed that all jobs are equal. Work is work, and we should respect all kinds of work. There shouldn't be a hierarchy that some people are respected more for the kind of work they do and other people are looked down upon. So in other words, he said that a barber's job, a hairdresser, is the same as a lawyer. So why should we discriminate? Or whether you sweep the street, you're still doing a job and you should be respected as much as you would respect a lawyer or a doctor. So those were the philosophical understanding, you know, that Tolstoy um, had. And he also believed that uh, people should live a simple life. Because if everybody simplified their lives, then everyone in the country would have 
basic necessities of life, nobody would suffer. It's only because some people want to live a better life that other people suffer. And so, uh, based on that philosophy, Gandhiji felt that he should look for a place in a rural area and simplify his life. So that's when the alteration in his lifestyle began in 1904, and he bought this 100-acre piece of land in Inanda, and he set up a settlement there. He invited people. According to that philosophy, if, uh, you know, if you subscribe to that philosophy, come here, build your little house, and let all of us live as equals there. We grow our own vegetables and become self-sufficient, and we work in the press, because he had started the Indian Opinion in 1903. At, in 1903, it was located in Durban, but in 1904, when he set up the Phoenix Settlement, they moved the press to Phoenix Settlement. And so all the people who lived on Phoenix Settlement worked in the, uh, in, in opinion, the, the press. And um, they grew their own vegetables and lived together in a communal kind of life. And, and who were his neighbors uh, around Phoenix Settlement? His neighbors were um, mainly African people, although at that time they, there was the um, Mount Edgecombe sugar barracks that was very close to um, Phoenix settlement. So the indentured workers who were living in that barracks were close to him, Mount Edgecombe and uh, Waterloo and Blackburn and all those barracks. There were some white uh, people in that area, landowners. There were some Indian landowners who had um, acquired some pieces of land uh, after, you know, finishing uh, indenture. They were given a piece of land and they lived in Inanda as well. But the most, um, you know, prominent people were Mr. Shembe and uh, Mr. Dubey, who lived uh, as neighbors to Gandhiji. And he had very close contact with both Mr. Shembe and Mr. Dubey. Uh, around this time, how many people were staying at, at, at the settlement? I can't give you the exact number, but uh, about uh, 30 to 40 people. Mm -hmm. So uh, others were working for the for the printing press, and then other people, what, 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 what were they doing? Or there were a number of things yes. that uh, people would do, but everyone yes. had a role in the printing press, even as I was growing, you know, yes. uh, as a little child, because the newspaper, everything was done manually. In that newspaper, in that printing press, you had uh, types, mm -hmm. alphabets. There was a big box with little um, containers, you know, little uh, spaces, and you had every alphabet in a little box there. And uh, you had to then put the alphabets together in order to make your sentence, your words, your sentence. You had your comma and your full stop there, your capital letters and all that, and you had to put that one at a time set it, and then your proofs were done by a machine where you put all this at, as a page uh, on a little uh, you know, board at the bottom, and then you place the paper on it, and you get your proof. And in the same way, it was uh, printed, all done by hand. Then you folded it, you wrote the addresses on the envelope, you stuck your stamps and everything. And all that takes time. So as a little child, I learned to do things, you know, as you grow up, you learn uh, more uh, skills. But uh, you, as a little child, you know how to fold the newspaper, so you learn how to fold it. And then you learn how to write the wrappers, you know, the addresses on the wrappers. And then you learn how to typeset. So we learned everything 
you know, gradually as we grew up. And the same with all the children who lived on the Phoenix settlement and all the residents who lived on the Phoenix settlement. It was their press, and they came in and they learned and they developed the skills. Okay, the day started very early on Phoenix settlement. Um, on a normal day, we would get up at about five o'clock in the morning. Uh, usually, my father would, uh, you know, take us out to uh, do some gardening. We did work in the, um, you know, uh, garden. Uh, we, we planted vegetables, we made compost, uh, you know, collected all the leaves, cleaned up the gardens and so on. Uh, so for about uh, an hour and a half early in the morning, we would work in the garden. Of course, it depended on whether it was winter or summer as to what time. So it wasn't a strict um, timing. Then by about uh, six o'clock, we would, um, you know, get dressed and so on and um, have breakfast by seven. And then thereafter, it was uh, work in the press, uh, but different things that uh, each person would have to do. Um, you know, some of us would be busy with uh, cleaning the house and that sort of thing. Uh, others would go to the press and uh, do the work there. My father usually got up at two o'clock in the morning and wrote his editorial because he felt that, you know, he could think uh, clearly at that time when everybody else was sleeping and it was quiet and so on. So he would uh, write his editorials at two and he would also go for a walk early in the morning for about uh, 45 minutes. He would go right up to Dubé Farm and then come around uh, where Shemi's, um, you know, uh, uh, place was and uh, come home. It was about 10 kilometers or something that he would walk on a daily basis. Uh, and all the people used to see him going around. So they knew that early in the morning, it's my father who would be walking around there. And he would come back by about six and then, um, you know, join us with whatever we uh, were doing. And um, yeah, and then go to the press and start work there. Can you also tell In the us evenings, we had prayers every evening at uh, 5.30, 6 o'clock, between 5.30 and 6. And um, usually, the prayers comprised of all religious faiths. So we had a Christian prayer, a Hindu prayer, um, a Muslim prayer. We also had a Parsi prayer because there were some people who were of Parsi uh, you know, background. They would um, then say a Parsi prayer. And if we had people of other religious faiths, mm -hmm. they would say their prayer as well. And it was usually in the open. Uh, there was no like a temple or anything. We didn't believe in having a particular kind of building in which you have to pray. We prayed in the open. And, and, and tell us about the philosophy of passive resistance. I mean, exactly when did it begin uh, and, and, and its influence to other leaders? Okay. Mm. Um, passive resistance was there for a long time. I mean, there were lots of people who uh, had, you know, used non-violent ways of uh, dealing with the uh, issues. But uh, Gandhiji started Satyagraha, and that was different because Satyagraha now wasn't passive. He said it's this, this form of resistance is not passive, it's very active. You are actually doing something, you are protesting and it requires more courage to stand even uh, and be nonviolent, even if you're facing a gun. You know, you stand there and 
uh, it requires more courage than to face an opponent who has got a weapon and hit them or use violence against them. So um, he then asked for people to coin a word for this kind of uh, movement. And it was in 1906 that uh, you know, people gave in their suggestions, the names you know, that they would think would be appropriate. And he felt that this was the most appropriate name. And that's how Satyagraha came about. The name suggested by the person who wrote the, first, uh, the winning essay was Sadagraha which means uh, compel, you know, uh, compel um, in a good cause, compulsion in a good cause. But it didn't have truth in it. So Gandhiji uh, said, no, instead of Sadagraha, let's have Satyagraha. Satya means truth, and Agraha means force, or soul force, or, you know, uh, pursued. And this is a Gujarati word? It's a Sanskrit it's a word, Sanskrit, Sanskrit yes. yeah. Okay. And so, yeah. So, the, the, the philosophy behind Satyagraha mm -hmm. was that when you see evil, you shouldn't, by, by just accepting it, you are condoning evil. Mm -hmm. uh, that you have to do something about it. In, in post day in 1994, South Africa, you became a member of uh, parliament. Can you tell us about that? Okay. Um, firstly, you know, I was, uh, I forgot to mention that mm -hmm. apart from the NIC, I was also involved in the women's organization, which is very, mm -hmm. for me, a very important um, part of my life. And that is the Natal organization of women that I was involved in. and. Uh, when uh, ANC got unbanned, we joined the ANC Women's League. And that's how I was involved in uh, the political activities, um, both in the Italian Congress as well as the Women's League and the Natal Organization of Women. And um, so I went into Parliament uh, and, you know, I represented women for one thing. And also my constituency was Phoenix, uh, Phoenix Township. I represented them. And uh, for me, the first uh, Parliament in 1994 was about changing a lot of things because there were uh, many, many laws in, in the um, country that were not in line with our thinking uh, in terms of non-racism, in terms of non-sexism, in terms of having a more egalitarian society and so on. So we had to look at these laws and see how we can change these laws in order to achieve these kinds of beliefs that we had. And so it was a long process, very interesting, very hard uh, work. And that's what we did in the first five years. I think it's a record number of laws that we made in that year, in that term, and a record number of changes that we made to laws. So it was very hard work, yeah. Yes. If, if we can go back to the 80s and, or 70s, you were also banned, am I right? That's right. Yes. From 1973 yeah. to 1982. Yeah. And, 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 and so, so uh, under those banning orders, what were you not allowed to do and what were you allowed to do? Can you sort of explain that? Well, there were a lot of things. Uh, the, the first banning order, yes. it was a house arrest, actually. Yes. It involved three documents. The first document is that you um, are not allowed to interact with people on a social level. So you, you're not allowed to communicate with people and that sort of thing. That's the first document that they give you. All social contact is prohibited, but you can go any way you like. 
only thing is you don't uh, you know, have this social contact with people. The second order is an order which limits you to a place. So you can only travel within a particular boundary. So uh, we couldn't kind of go out of that Tibetan magisterial area. The, the so was also banned. Yes, that's right. Yes, you were banned around the same time? Uh, he was banned before me, uh, five years before. He had a okay. five-year banning order. Okay. Then when he got the second banning order, I also was uh, house arrested. The second order for both of us was a house arrest order. The first one for him was a banning order, not a house arrest. So the third order is the house arrest. That means that you can't leave your house between certain times, like 7 o'clock in the evening. You have to be indoors in your home until 7 in the morning. No matter what the emergency or anything, you're not allowed to leave the house. You have to be in the house. What type of work were you doing at that time that made the, that prompted the government to, to, to ban you? What type of... Well, in 72, yes. we launched the Natal Indian Congress. I was elected as uh, vice president of the Natal Indian Congress. And in 73, I got a banning order. I was uh, the first one of the um, Congress officials who was banned. After me, um, you know, George Supersad, who was the president, of uh, NIC, he got banned, and then several other people from uh, the Congress got banned. So I presume that the banning order was uh, because of my activities in Congress, maybe because of uh, the Natal Organization of Women. They don't give you reasons, you know, that. They just tell you you're a uh, uh, danger to the security of the state. Okay.